Namaste Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschachadeshatarine Vanchakaupatarabhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So we're studying Third Canto Srimad Bhagavatam Teachings of Lord Kapila at the level of Bhakti Vaibhav. Today we are on chapter number 29. So chapter 25 began with Bhakti Yoga. Then chapter 26 we heard about the analysis of all the different elements of the material nature. That's Jnana Yoga. In chapter 27 we learned about application of that jnana yoga, further, further knowledge, applying that knowledge. And then chapter 28, yesterday we spoke about the astanga yoga, which was meditation on the super soul. And we heard all the descriptions of the super soul, how to contemplate the different limbs of the body of the Lord. So today we're going on chapter 29, we're going to hear, we're coming back to devotional service again, and we're going to hear about how devotional service can also be influenced by the modes of nature. All right, so I'll, I'll just share the screen for the... What's this? Okay, everyone can see this PowerPoint, okay? Yes, yes Maharaj. Okay, so chapter 29, Explanation of Devotional Service by Lord Kapila. Let's first of all glorify Srimad Bhagavatam. O Srimad Bhagavatam, O nectar churned from the ocean of all scriptures, you are the most prominent transcendental fruit of the Vedas. Enriched with the jewels of all conclusive truth, you grant spiritual vision to all the people of the world. O life breath of the Vaishnava devotees, O Lord, you are the sun which has risen to dispel the darkness of Kali Yuga. You are actually Lord Krishna who has returned among us. O Srimad Bhagavatam, I offer my respectful obeisances unto you. By your recitation one attains transcendental bliss because your syllables shower pure love of God upon the reader. You are always to be served by everyone for you are an incarnation of Lord Krishna. O Srimad Bhagavatam, O my only friend, O my companion, O my teacher, O my great wealth, O my deliverer, O my good fortune, O my bliss, I offer my respectful obeisances unto you. O Srimad Bhagavatam, O bestower of saintliness to the unsaintly, O uplifter of the most fallen, 
Please don't ever leave me. Accompanied by pure love of Krishna, please manifest yourself in my heart and in my throat. Okay, so the chapter begins with Devahuti putting more questions. All right, we've seen Devahuti's got a very inquisitive nature and she makes making good use of this nature to bring out more about the nature of the Sankhya Yoga process. So Lord Kapila will describe how Bhakti practiced under the material modes, how, what are the results of Bhakti in the modes of nature, what's the effect, what are the symptoms. And then he will describe pure bhakti, nirguna bhakti. And we'll hear about devotional practices, their results, dealing respectfully with all living beings, right? This is an important point which is often quoted here from the 29th chapter here of the third canto, seeing the Lord within all living entities seeing them respectfully. And then different levels of living entities are described and following Lord Kapila's instruction, you go back to Godhead and then the chapter goes into a little different topic at the end here, the, the devastating effect of time. This is because of Devahuti's question. Lord Kapila has to answer her questions. So here are Devahuti's questions put at the beginning of the chapter. My dear Lord, you have already very scientifically described the symptoms of the total material nature and the characteristics of the spirit according to the Sankhya system of philosophy. Now I request you to explain the path of devotional service, which is the ultimate end of all philosophical systems. Well, Lord Kapila described all about the material nature, the, the symptoms, all the different characteristics, everything. We heard all of this, chapter 26. Now in the 27, 28 was describing more about the nature of the spirit and contact with the material energy. So now I want to hear about devotional service. The goal of the yoga, the top of the yoga ladder. Uh, Devahuti continues, explain in detail the path of bhakti, which is the root cause of the knowledge of Sankhya. So this is going to be answered in this chapter between verses 7 to 34. We'll get the answers to this question. And then... Devahuti also wants to know, describe about the nature of time, by whose fear people perform pious acts. So Devahuti wants to know about the facts of time and that's going to be answered also in this chapter, text number 35 to the end of the chapter, 45. And then, she also wants to know, question in text 3, describe about the continual process of birth and death of the jivas, hearing which one becomes detached. And that will be answered in the chapters 30 to 32. Next week we go on. It's, next week's section is quite light. These chapters are pretty heavy, deeply philosophical. The other chapters, not so philosophical, but uh, powerful. We'll hear about the process of birth and death. We'll hear about life in the womb. We'll hear about dying, what happens at death. 
And a little more about time is also there. So ch chapters 30 to 32 answer or describe the process of birth and death. From Prabhupada's purport, Bhakti Yoga is the basic principle of all systems of philosophy. All philosophy which does not aim for devotional service to the Lord is considered merely mental speculation. But of course, Bhakti Yoga with no philosophical basis is more or less sentiment. Right? Prabhupada said, right? Philosophy. Uh, religion without philosophy is sentiment. So here Prabhupada is saying the same thing. Bhakti yoga with no philosophical basis is sentiment. And philosophy without religion is speculation. So this same point is being brought up here. Speculation, anything which doesn't aim for devotional service, you may have philosophy, just speculation. And if you have bhakti with no philosophical basis, sentiment. So both are there, both should be there. Philosophy and proper religion, bhakti. The devotee's compassion attracts the Lord's mercy. Lord Kapila was very satisfied by the request of his glorious mother because she was thinking not only in terms of her personal salvation but in terms of all the fallen conditioned souls. That is real compassion when we care about others, devotees. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, who is most dear to him? The one who is teaching, one who is teaching this message of devotional service, he is the most dear to Krishna because he has some compassion on others. Lord Chaitanya appreciated the compassion of Vasudev Datta. Vasudev Datta was very compassionate. He told Lord Chaitanya, let me take the sins of all the people. I will stay here. Let them all be delivered. Lord Chaitanya said, oh, wonderful. He said, you must be Prahlad. You are in the mood of Prahlad Maharaj. So compassion, a very important quality of devotee. The Lord is always compassionate towards the fallen souls of this material world. And therefore he comes himself or sends his confidential servants to deliver them. Since he is perpetually compassionate towards them, if some of his devotees also become compassionate towards them, he is very pleased with the devotees. We want to develop that compassion. We offer obeisances to the Vaishnava devotees every day that uh, I, we offer our respectful obeisances to all the Vaishnava devotees of the Lord who are full of compassion for all the fallen. They're just like desire trees can fulfill the desires of everyone and are full of compassion for the fallen conditioned souls. We spoke, judge the sin, not the sinner. Feel compassion on the sin, the sinners, don't just condemn them. We should think how to deliver them. So we want to please Lord Nityananda, you want to please Lord Nityananda, you want to please Lord Krishna, show compassion on the fallen souls and think how to deliver them, how to give them Krishna consciousness. It's from text number six. Okay, going on to the various classes of bhakti. Now we have to understand bhakti can also be influenced by the modes of nature. Sometimes we are thinking everything we do is pure devotion. Of course, it's not. 
our activities, even though we may be thinking we're doing bhakti yoga, they can also be influenced by the modes of nature. We can worship the deity. You may be in the mode of ignorance, you may be in the mode of passion, you may be in the mode of goodness, you may not be pure devotion. We hope you are, but you may not be. It's not just the activity, but the attitude with which we perform the activities. So this is a very important section of this, the teachings of Lord Kapila. Actually, the path of devotional service is one without a second. But according to the devotee's condition, devotional service appears in multifarious varieties, as will be nicely explained in the following verses. We're going to hear the different varieties of devotional service. First of all, devotional service in the mode of ignorance. Devotional service executed by a person who is envious, proud, violent and angry and who is a separatist is considered to be in the mode of darkness. Right? Envy. Well, we're all envious of Krishna, I know that. That's why we're all here in the material world. But if we're envious of a devotee, then it's really bad. We have to give up envy and we have to give up pride. If we are proud, then we're not going to please Krishna. And sometimes people are violent and angry. That's really bad. When we get physical about it, envy and pride are subtle, but violence and anger, anger they're gross, they're manifest. You can see people behaving like that. That is devotional service in the mode of ignorance. They may be doing devotional service. They may be on Sankirtan, they may be worshipping the deity, they may be cooking in the kitchen, they may be chanting. But if we do it in this manner, and also I mentioned as a, a separatist, separatist, meaning our interest is not for Krishna. We have our own separate interest at heart. We're not thinking about Krishna. So this is devotional service in the mode of ignorance. You go and worship the deity, you can go on the altar and you're in an angry mood, you're really angry at people, or you may go on the altar and you're feeling very proud. I want everyone to see me, I'm a great devotee, I'm worshipping the deity. This is the mode of ignorance. You don't, get the you don't get the real benefit of devotional service. Angry, devoid of compassion, worships the Lord with intentions of violence, pride and hatred. It's really bad. From the commentary of Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, our great Acharya, one should not say that bhakti becomes tamasic. Rather, the particular person in question is tamasic. Oh, you see the point he's making? That it's not that the bhakti is in the mode of ignorance, but it's the person who is in the mode of ignorance. He is angry. He does not see happiness and distress equally in himself and others. In other words, he is without compassion. With a goal of violence, pride and hatred, the angry person with no compassion who performs bhakti, who performs bhakti to me, to Krishna, 
is tamasic. So this is Lord Krishna speaking. The bhakti is not tamasic, but the person is. So the person, he's doing bhakti, bhakti, but he's in the mode of ignorance. So now, devotional service, the person is in the mode of passion. The worship of deities in the temple by a separatist with a motive for material enjoyment, fame and opulence is devotion in the mode of passion. So some people worship the deity. It, it happens like this. As I said, somebody wants to be known, a very pious, very religious person. He wants people to see him going on the altar. That is the mode of passion. Somebody wants to get opulence, they're worshipping the deities, but their motive is to get opulence. Maybe the opulence is to eat all the Mahaprasadam. They think, I'm the pujari, all the Mahaprasadam is mine. M material enjoyment. We, we worship the deities. All that money given to the deities, I'll take it for me. I'm the pujari. So they're giving money, I'm taking it. This is a mode of passion. We're not thinking of Krishna. It's sep this is the separatist mentality. The, the, the motive is not for Krishna, but it's for ourself. We've separated ourselves. So, people, th th this material world, this is a place of passion. Everybody's in the mode of passion here. So much passion, especially in a city. Most of our temples are in the city. In the city, everybody's in the mode of passion. And that passion, we bring that passionate mentality into our bhakti, into our devotion. Even on the altar, worshipping the deities. Material motives are there. Worships the Lord with desire for other objects, with goals of material gain, fame, or wealth. Because I'm serving Krishna, Krishna is going to give me, make me, Krishna will give me money, Krishna will give me fame, people will recognize me and respect me. So the material motives, not pure devotion. Srila Prabhupada explains the word separatist he said, this word must be understood carefully. The Sanskrit words in this connection are binadrik, pritak bhava. A separatist is one who sees his interest as separate from that of the Supreme Lord. Mixed devotees. Remember we spoke about mixed devotees the other day? Mixed devotees. That they're... They're not pure devotees, they're mixed devotees because they have material desires and they have some desire and interest in other paths, not fully fixed in bhakti, not interest is not to Krishna. So mixed devotees are devotees in the modes of passion and ignorance, think that the interest of the Supreme Lord is supplying the orders of the devotees. Yeah, mixed devotees, they've got some desires, they want, they think, it's my, in my it's, I want to go back to Godhead. Well, that's good, <laughs> but it's not, it shouldn't be the motive, the out, it shouldn't be the only motive. We, we should have some love for Krishna. We should have some attachment for the Lord, concern for Krishna not just concerned for ourselves, not just thinking what I want. I want to get out of this world, so I'm doing. The interest should be for Krishna. But these devotees, they think the Lord, he has to supply whatever the devotee wants. They think Krishna is our order supplier. 
Just call him up and he'll deliver whatever you need. Some people have that mood in worshipping the deity. The interest of such devotees is to draw from the Lord as much as possible for their sense gratification. This is the separatist mentality. So if you have this kind of mentality, your, your, your worship of Krishna is not very good, it's not on a very good standard. Srila Prabhupada explains, Mayavadis, however, interpret this word separatist in a different way. They say that while worshipping the Lord, one should think himself one with the Supreme Lord. This is another adulterated form of devotion within the modes of material nature. You see, the Mayavadis are thinking, ultimately, it's all one. And so they worship the Lord, they should think they're one with the Lord. They understand the word. Their interpretation of the word separatist is very different from the devotees. The Mayavadis, they just always want to make everything just one. So this is... This is just another contamination on the path of devotion. So now devotion in the mode of goodness is described. Note, the mode of goodness is still not pure goodness. It's still influenced by the modes of nature. So when a devotee worships the personality of Godhead, and offers the results of his activities in order to free himself from the, the inebrities of fruit of act activities, his devotion is in the mode of goodness. You can see Prabhupada uh, is explained here, Lord Kapila is explaining, text number 10, that one in the mode of goodness, he wants to get rid of his sinful reactions. And he's worshipping the deity for that purpose. That I've done a lot of bad things, I have to get rid of my bad karma, I will worship Krishna to destroy my bad karma. The motive is not pure love. So it's not pure devotion. It's, there's no real devotion there. It, we're only thinking about ourselves. that I Want, I've got this karma, I want to get rid of my karma. So I worship Krishna, Krishna will change my karma. Krishna will remove the karma. So he worships the Lord with a desire to destroy karma, makes his work as an offering to the Lord, and worships as a matter of duty to achieve liberation. There's no question of pleasing Krishna. It's desire to destroy karma, a sense of duty, liberation. His work. His work is an offering to Krishna. This is my offering to you, Krishna. Take it. Okay, going ahead, text 11 and 12, we'll hear about pure devotion. We know pure devotion, you've studied nectar of devotion, and Bhagavad Gita, you've seen a lot about pure devotion. So it's also described here. The manifestation of unadulterated devotional service is exhibited when one's mind is at once attracted to hearing the transcendental name and qualities of the Supreme Personality of Godhead who is residing in everyone's heart, right? The mind is attracted to hearing. Just as the water of the Ganges flows naturally down towards the ocean, such devotional ecstasy, uninterrupted by any material condition, flows towards the Supreme Lord. So, the example was given about the Ganga 
Anybody bathed in the Ganga, you know how the Ganges is always flowing down towards the sea. So the, the pure devotee's mind flows like that, naturally attracted to the service of Krishna. Spontaneous attraction. So this is the mood of pure devotion, nirguna bhakti. Bhakti without influence of the modes. Characteristics of this pure bhakti. Beyond the gunas, no influence of the modes of nature. It's got to be shuddha sattva, pure, without any passion or ignorance. No thought even of herself. The absence of results other than bhakti. The absence of results other than bhakti. All we want is devotion. Other paths, you know, you do karma yoga, you do jnana, that there's different results. People want something, they want to go to higher planets, they want yoga powers, they want liberation, the jnani wants liberation, the karmi wants to enjoy the material world. But devotee simply wants bhakti. We want more devotion. We're doing bhakti, we want to get more bhakti. Lack of obstructions from other processes. Lack of obstructions. The obstructions come. Maybe different criteria, other processes. So many different restrictions what you can do, what you can't do. But bhakti, it's open. And if anyone, any position can take up bhakti and do bhakti without any restrictions. Other processes, so many obstructions. Oh, you're not a Brahman, you cannot do it. Oh, you're not a Hindu, you cannot do it. Oh, you're contaminated. Oh, you cannot do it. I like this. So many obstructions, but bhakti, you can do anybody, anybody can do any time. Purified or unpurified, contaminated or not, you can do bhakti. Devotee does not accept any kind of liberation unless it involves service to Lord Krishna. So devotee doesn't want even to go to ha ha go to the they don't want to go into the spiritual world unless there's an opportunity to do service to Krishna. And so the impersonal Brahma Jyoti is hell for a devotee because there's no opportunity to do service there. The impersonal Brahman, there's only the oneness. There's no activity. And so that is hell for a devotee. A devotee will go to hell if there's a chance to serve Krishna. Hell becomes heaven for a devotee if devotional service is there. But heaven becomes hell if there's no service. And the ultimate goal of this is to get love of God. We get Krishna Prem, the highest state. So we can come to that Krishna Prem by practice of pure bhakti. Some more characteristics. Avicina, without interruptions, no material conditions can stop the flow of the devotional service of a pure devotee, as the flow of the Ganges cannot be stopped by any condition. Right? We say, Ahaitaki apriti, Savaipum sam yato dharmo yato bhaktir adhoksaje, Ahaitaki apratiyata yayatma suprasid. In Srimad Bhagavatam, second chapter, first canto, it's described. The supreme occupation for all humanity is loving service. Such service must be unmotivated, uninterrupted. Here again, the same word, without interruption. Our devotional service has to be continuous, no stopping, no deviation. We have to go on. Without reason, we're not 
ahaitiki apratita, we're not thinking what we're going to get, what's our, what's our, what's, what are we going to be given for it. Without cessation, 24 hours a day, 24-7 right? we often say, like these shops which never close. So a devotee, his life is molded that at every minute, at every second, he's engaged in some sort of devotional service. Another meaning of the word avyavahita is that the interest of the devotee and the interest of the Supreme Lord are on the same level. Devotee has no interest but to fulfill the transcendental desire of the Supreme Lord. Of course, that is one of the items of surrender. Six items of surrender you learned in Bhagavad Gita. Krishna says, give up all religion, just surrender unto me. And then in the purport, Prabhupada just defines what surrender means. And one of the items is to have no desire other than the desire of Krishna. So this same point is made here also. Don't desire anything except service to Krishna. Then different kinds of liberation. A devotee desires nothing but the Lord's service. Devotee is, we're not thinking about this kind of liberation, but if Krishna gives it, we can accept it. So these four kinds of liberation are mentioned here. Salokya, Sharsti, Samipya, Sarupya. Right? To have the same, to live on the same planet as the Lord, to enjoy the same opulence of the Lord, to be a companion of the Lord, or to have a form similar to the Lord. These are four different kinds of liberation which can be offered to the devotee. But the devotee doesn't desire them, but if, if Krishna gives them, we can accept them. Devotional practices for the purification of the mind. We need to purify our mind. So, there are activities which we can do to purify our mind. So, verse 15 describes, a devotee must execute his prescribed duties, which are glorious, without material profit, without excessive violence, one should regularly perform one's devotional activities. So how we perform these duties? We have to do these things and we have to do them with the proper attitude. So it's mentioned, without material profit, in material life we're always thinking, what's the profit? What am I going to get? Without violence, we have to do these things in a peaceful manner, not agitated, disturbed, right? We have to go, let me see, I have to, we have to go to text 16 and read. Uh, Okay, this text 16. The text 16 describes. Text 16 from the book I'm reading. The devotee should regularly see my statues in the temple, touch my lotus feet, and offer worshipable paraphernalia and prayer. 
he should see in the spirit of renunciation from the mode of goodness and see every living entity as spiritual. So Lord Kapila is describing the activities which a devotee has to do to keep the level of pure goodness. You have to go to the temple, we have to see the deities, and we should worship the deities, offer prayers. It's important for us, these activities. People often go to temple, they, don't, they just walk around and they look at people. They don't offer prayers. They go to the, when we go to the temple, we should recite prayers. Just like we have when we greet the deities, we play the Govinda prayers. But you can recite also. Even they're not playing the Govinda prayers, we can recite ourselves. We should have prayers which we say every day and offer worship different sometimes you may be fortunate you get the opportunity to offer worship even you're not worshiping if you're attending the arti and observing the arti and performing kirtan for the deities that is also worship of the deity sometimes we read the books read the scriptures that is also for the pleasure of the deity the deity can see, he sees us dancing, he can hear, he has ears, he can hear us chanting. We have to understand, we go into the temple room for the pleasure of the deities, to chant for the deities, to speak for the deities, to recite for the deities, to bow down for the pleasure of the deity. So this is the mood. And we're told, see every living entity as spiritual. This is important also. Some people, they only respect the deity. They don't respect that God is in the heart of everyone. Text 17 goes on, the pure devotee should execute devotional service by giving the greatest respect to the spiritual master and the acharyas. He should be compassionate to the poor, make friendship with persons who are his equals, but all his activities should be executed under regulation and with control of the senses. So again, the attitude of the devotee this is of this verse of course is similar to what we heard from the nectar of instruction respecting devotees on different levels we give the greatest respect to the acharyas at the same time we we're compassionate to the poor the innocent we show them compassion make friends with persons who are our equals this is like majam adhikari right and of course we avoid those people who are atheistic and demonic. But all the activities should be regulated. There has to be control of the senses. Showing compassion to the poor. I mean, not looking down on them, but thinking of the, how to help them, how to elevate them, how to give them Krishna consciousness. Text 18, more, more qualities of the pure devotee. A devotee should always try to hear about spiritual matters and should always utilize his time in chanting the holy name of the Lord. His behavior should always be straightforward and simple. And although he is not envious but friendly to everyone, he should avoid the company of persons who are not spiritually advanced. So, very similar to what we've heard before about Madhyama Adhikari. But important point is utilize our time carefully. Don't waste time. Always chant the holy name. Lord Chaitanya said, Kirtaniya Sadahari. Always chant. Don't ever think that I've finished my rounds. We think, I've done 16 rounds, I've finished my rounds. 
16 is the minimum. Our behavior should always be straightforward, not duplicitous. Straightforward, honest and simple. Not envious, friendly to everyone. Avoid the company of persons who are not spiritually advanced. So we avoid the atheists, the blasphemers, the envious. We, we avoid them, means we don't give them a chance to become more critical. But we don't offend them. We're careful about that. Text 19 goes on, when one is fully qualified with all these transcendental attributes and his consciousness is thus completely purified, he is immediately attracted simply by hearing my name or hearing of my transcendental quality. So that's, you can see that the stage of pure devotion, his consciousness is purified and he's attracted by hearing the holy name or hearing qualities of Krishna. He wants to hear, he's eager to hear. That eagerness, very important quality of the devotee. Okay, are there any questions so far? Maharaj, uh, in, in, in all these verses, at least four or five verses from 8 to 18, it has been emphasized how one should not, uh, how one should avoid the company of a person who is not spiritually advanced. I'm thinking for myself, if I am not an advanced, um, then uh, who will associate with me? And, and how, how, uh, I'm still trying to understand how can a Vaishnava be, you know, not of a good character and still a Vaishnava. So I'm still trying to comprehend the information. Maharaj, if you can please elaborate on that. Yes, we, we will think naturally, I, I'm, not a, I'm not an advanced devotee, so nobody will want to associate with me. But we can take association from advanced devotees because advanced devotees, if they're really advanced, they'll want to show compassion on other people, right? One who is actually advanced, he will want to give mercy, he will want to share whatever he has with other two people. We may not be advanced, but we want to become advanced. And we want to hear about Krishna and we do want to take advantage of the advanced devotees association. We're willing to give service. We know nobody wants to serve me, nobody wants to give service to me, but we want to take, we want to give service to others. So we can give service to the advanced devotees. That's good. We're not advanced. But doesn't mean we cannot give service to the advanced devotees. So that's and, a... and at the same time, please, thank you, Maharaj. But at the same time, then what and how should we avoid those who are not spiritually advanced? So how do we understand? Because then I would be judging. Uh, then that would be an offense. Uh, so how one needs to be careful while well, having association also? Well, usually the instruction, it, it's not just those who are not spiritually advanced, but it's those who don't want to advance spiritually. But they don't want to advance spiritually. They, they may be offenders, they may be blasphemers, they may be envious. They're not serious about Krishna consciousness. It's these people we want to avoid. Right? 
but they uh, but they can still be within the devotee community yes like they are because he just mentioned they can be devotees of krishna yes they're devotees but they're not practicing seriously they haven't taken a they don't make a serious commitment to practice you know, they, you, we see so that. In such a situation, one should. In such a situation, one should keep distance from them. You don't have to associate intimately. We respect them within the mind because they're chanting the holy name. But we don't have to get close to them, that you have to associate with them all the time and hear from them. You, you want to it's clear to me you want to hear from the people who are serious in Krishna consciousness who are really practicing genuine devotee other people some people come oh they have nothing else to do they come and they hang around the temple and when it comes to Japa you know they're hanging around they got their hand in their bead bag but they never chant they just talk and laugh and joke and uh, you know they and they go come to class and maybe they don't come to class, they just avoid the class or they, they fall asleep in the class, they don't hear anything. And so, you know, they're not too committed, not very much committed in Krishna consciousness, but their devotees are coming, so we respect them within the mind. But you're cautious about taking too much association from them. You don't want to... You don't want to spend a lot of time with them and be friendly with them and run around with them. Is it okay? I have one more question. Yes, yes, Kalimah Maharaj. I have one more question related to deity worship. When one gets an opportunity to worship deities, so I may be thinking I am serving the Lord, but certainly there may be pride and certainly there may be a pride that I have the opportunity to serve the deity form of the Lord. So how I can correct myself, rectify myself, even though if, it's, if unknowingly it's going somewhere subtly in my mind, but I'm thinking that I'm just going to serve the Lord. Yes, in a sense, so we, sh we, should th we should think we're very fortunate to worship the deity. We should understand we're very fortunate that the person who's worshipping the deity is very fortunate because he's directly offering service to the Supreme Lord. So that kind of pride, that is good. There's nothing wrong with that kind of pride. But if our pride is that I am better than other people, rather if, if we're thinking that I, you know, I'm, I'm worthy of this, I deserve this, I'm better, I've got this chance. So that kind of pride, to think that we're better than other people. Rather, devotees should think I, I'm getting this opportunity because Krishna knows how fallen I am. He's giving me the chance to worship Him. Although I'm so fallen, He's giving me the chance to purify myself by engaging me in His worship. I'm so fortunate. So that kind of pride is good. Thank you so much for this clarification. Thank you. Thank you so much for this clarification. Thank you. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Please accept humble devices, Maharaj. My one question is that uh, I just want to clarify one quality that seeing every living entity as is spiritual how practically we can apply in our life? Well, just properly understanding that every they're all living entities, they're all spirit souls, they're part and parcel of Krishna. And so, there was one Christian saint, you know, Prabhupada had gone to that one monastery when he was in Australia one time devotees took Prabhupada to this monastery where these monks were all living and they were very nice monks you know and, and they were very respectful to Prabhupada and they told Prabhupada they worshipped a person they, their, their saint of their church was someone called 
Saint Francis of Assisi. I don't know if you ever heard of him anyway. It's quite well known, Saint Francis of Assisi. And you know, it's a Christian group. And but he they told him that Saint Francis he used to talk to the flowers and the trees and my brother sister my brother tree sister flower like this and when Prabhupada heard this Prabhupada said oh he said that is real God consciousness so this mood of seeing all forms of life like that you know as Krishna says aham bijapradapita he is the the father of everyone. So we think of all different living entities like our brothers and sisters. So we should have that respect for every form of life that it's all connected to Krishna. Everything. Nothing, they're not just simply there for our exploitation or our abuse. So that doesn't mean we don't use the, cow, we use the cow to give milk and the bull to plough the fields. And every living entity is entitled to some respect. Just like in the Holy Dham, we give the dogs prasadam. And there's a story, Ramanujacharya, Ramanujacharya had gone to... Uh, Tirupati, and they stayed there for some days, and after some days they left Tirupati and went to another place. So they were carrying with them, they brought some food with them, they brought it from Tirupati. And when they went to take the food which they brought from Tirupati, they'd been traveling for a couple of days, and they had this food, they'd been traveling for a couple of days. So they, they looked at the food, there were some insects there in the food. And Ramanuja said immediately, we have to go back to Tirupati. And they went all the way back to Tirupati and devotees were wondering, why did we come back? Ramanuja said, these insects were born in Tirupati, it's a holy place. He said, we shouldn't take them away from the holy place. So that is that kind of respect for other forms of life. These creatures who are living in the holy dam, the trees in the Holy Dham, the dogs in the Holy Dham, they're all very special living entities. And even they're not in the Holy Dham, but we respect them all as spirit souls. We have to see them all as spirit souls and think how to elevate them. So we see the dog, the dog somehow misuse of his independence, he's got the body of a dog. But if we can if, if, if we chant the holy name, then they benefit. So we have to develop this consciousness. Vidya vinaya sampani brahmani gavihastini suni chaiva svapaki samo pandita dashana. So this is Krishna's instruction in Bhagavad Gita. And especially one who's worshipping the deity. That we shouldn't just simply see Krishna in the deity and not in the hearts of the people. You know, the, 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 this point comes up in this chapter that somebody's worshipping the deity and they only see Krishna, they only see God in the deity. They don't see the Lord, the same Lord who's there in the deity is in the heart of all living entities. So one may worship the deity, he should not be proud and disrespect the common people, the ordinary people. They must see the Lord is also there in everyone's heart. It's very important to see the Lord there in everything. Thank you, Maharaj. It's a wonderful explanation. Yes. Any other question? Hare Krishna Maharaj. I wanted to ask about different kind of liberations and why devotees don't want to go like to Vaikuntha planets and to serve in Vaikuntha planets. So how to properly understand that? I thought that 
in Vaikuntha there are also devotional service and it's like good desire to aspire for spiritual work or can you a little bit clarify how to understand properly different kind of liberations? Different kinds of liberation? Yeah, because I thought that this liberation is that you reach Vaikuntha Loka, spiritual world. Well, that's so, right. In Vaikuntha Loka, these different liberations are there. But the devotee is not anxious to get that kind of liberation. The devotee is anxious for Krishna's service. The mood is to give service. The mood is not, I want liberation for myself, but the mood is, I want to serve Krishna. If Krishna wants to bring me to Vaikuntha, okay, I will go. And if Krishna wants me to get Swarupya Mukti and give me a body like him, okay, we will accept it and serve Krishna there. And the, sorry, I thought that in Vaikuntha Loka, the devotees all also engaged in devotional service. They do, they do. But some of them they are, aren't engaged, some of them are not doing devotional service or? No, everybody there is engaged in devotional service. Everyone in Vaikuntha is devotee. They're all attracted to hear the glories of the Lord. They all have natural attraction, they want to hear, they love to hear the glories of the Lord, to chant the holy name. They love to engage in Krishna's service. They cannot get to Vaikuntha without that. But the point is that liberation is not what the devotee is thinking. He's not just thinking of his own liberation, that I want this, I want to get that body. I want to be the, on the same planet as Krishna. I want to have the same opulences as Krishna. He's not trying to compete with Krishna. The mood, the devotee just wants service to Krishna. So if Krishna brings him back, the devotee accepts. Okay, thank you, Hare Krishna. So Lord Kapila is just pointing out that that, you know, that kind of liber liberation is there, but that's not the thinking of the devotee, that I want this. But when Krishna gives him liberation, all right, he goes. Wherever Krishna puts us, devo devotee goes anywhere. Narayana parasarve na kutasthinya vibhyate swarga apavarga narakesh vapito yata darshana. Wherever the devotee goes, it's heaven or hell or liberation, it's all the same. Wherever he goes, he's going to do service to Krishna. So that is the thinking of the, the pure devotees. So we see often in performing devotional service, we can be influenced, the modes of nature influence us. Although the bhakti itself is pure, that we're not, we're influenced by passion or we're influenced by ignorance, that is not pure devotional service. It's not going to give us the real purification we want. Sometimes people wonder, they say, I've been doing devotional service for so long now, why am I not a pure devotee now? The problem is often that they're doing devotional service influenced by the modes of nature. That they're, they're, they do their devotional service influenced by passion. They want fame or they want position, they want to get something in return. Or they do it in ignorance even, angry, violent, or lazy, come to do deity worship, they didn't take a, didn't take a shower, 
woke up late, hardly put, didn't put any tail icon, just simply put tail icon on the forehead only, and rush in the altar, ring the bell, you don't chant any prayers, don't offer obeisances, just ring the bell, open the curtain, go in there, do it all in a very undevotional, not very devotional manner. And so that kind of worship, it's, it's not pure devotion. You're not going to get the same benefit. Okay, we'll go ahead. So purification of the mind. We have to be careful. The attitude. No, there should not be pride. There should, we shouldn't be thinking, what am I going to get? What is Krishna going to give me? Well, all the devotee wants more devotion. That's important. We want more devotion. Minimum violence. <laughs> it, said, it said minimum violence. So Prabhupada explains here, even if a devotee has to commit violence, it should not be done beyond what is necessary. Right? Even, you, you know, you've got a lot of mosquitoes or a lot of cockroaches in your place. It shouldn't be done more, you shouldn't be more violent than necessary. Sometimes, you know, sometimes you're walking on the road and things will be there, you, you cannot avoid it sometimes. Or maybe you're driving a vehicle and there's, you know, something, dog or something runs in the car. Sometimes you, you don't do it on purpose, but we should try to minimize the violence. So Prabhupada explains, Arjuna engaged in the art of killing. And although killing is, of course, violence, he killed the enemy simply on Krishna's order. In the same way, if we commit violence as it is necessary by the order of the Lord, that is called natihimsa. We cannot avoid violence, for we are put into a conditional life in which we have to commit violence. But we should not commit more violence than necessary or that order by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Just like when, when Arjuna was fighting with Karna, he was fighting with Karna and Karna's chariot got stuck in the mud and it was the, uh, uh, Karna couldn't properly fight because his chariot was stuck. So Krishna said, Krishna told Arjuna, kill him. And Karna said, it's not fair, it's not fair, wait, look, my chariot is stuck in the mud, this is not fair, this is not Kshatriya way. But Krishna said, there was no mercy to Abhimanu, there will be no mercy now. So Arjuna killed Karna, it was ordered by Krishna. So sometimes violence has to be used. Sometimes the parents get angry at the child, they have to be violent. But it should be minimum violence. Right? Not excessive. We should be very careful killing insects. You can go to hell for that. There's a special hellish planet. People who kill all the insects, they go the sufferers, described in the fifth canto, Srimad Bhagavatam. So be very careful about using violence. Better is no violence, try to avoid it. Of course, some people, they go to extremes. We see like the Jains, the, we have the, the Ahimsa Jains, the, what are they called? Uh, uh, the different, uh, the Gamba Jain, Swatamba Jain. Uh, Swatamba. So they wear ahimsa cloth. They won't wear any cloth except ahimsa silk. They wait till the silkworm dies and then they take the cocoon of the silk. And then they sweep the road wherever they're walking. 
and everything is filtered, all the water is filtered, everything. Very careful, no violence. But cannot avoid. And you see sometimes even the, the, uh, the Buddhists, when they're building, they'll take the earth and they'll remove all the worms from the earth. Make sure there's no, no creatures even in the, within the earth. They're so conscious about other living entities. They don't want to commit violence. But violence is not the highest principle of religion. Prabhupada explains, he said, violence is a sub-religious sub principle. It's not the highest principle of religion. The highest principle of religion is to love God. The, just simply being non-violent, that doesn't make you a great devotee, it doesn't give you love of God. It's a, it's a quality, it's one of the qualities of one in knowledge. But it's very difficult to avoid all kinds of violence. What's more important is service to Krishna. Do service to Krishna. And sometimes Krishna wants us to use violence. Just like Arjuna had to use violence. Any questions on this? Everyone's okay, yeah? Using... Hare, Hare Krishna, Maharaj Dhanur Pranam. Hare Krishna. Uh, like uh, Arjuna was ordered by uh, Krishna, but how do we know, like, how do we get ordered? Well, we have Sadhu Shastra and Guru. Right? They're giving us orders. They're telling us what to do. They're guiding us. So, you can judge. Sadhu, Shastra and Guru, what do, what do they say? Are they telling you to do? No. Yeah, I get your point, Paraj. Thank you very much. Prabhupada used to, when Prabhupada had his room in Juhu, Mumbai, and uh, his quarters there, and, you know, there's always a lot of mosquitoes there. So sometimes Prabhupada's servant would be killing the mosquitoes and Prabhupada would tell them, don't turn my room into a crematorium. And, you know, he didn't want just killing all the insects. Another time, a devotee in Hyderabad said that the rats have been eating the, the boga Prabhupada. He said, Prabhupada, can I put rat poison down and kill them? Prabhupada said, you should be killed. Prabhupada told the devotee, you should be killed. He said, you, you're responsible, you leave the boga lying around and you let the rats come. Now you want to kill them. Said, this is not the way. You get boga, you should keep it, keep it safe. Either you keep it in a cold storage or you keep it in a container so the rats can't get it. And you should keep everything clean so the rats don't come. We make the situation which we attract these creatures. I heard also Prabhupada was in the kitchen in New York, he was cooking, and then a, a cockroach came. Prabhupada just knocked it out the window and told it, said, you go outside and enjoy out there. <laughs> That's Prabhupada's way. He threw it out the window and said, you go outside and enjoy. Okay. Thank you, Maharaj. So appreciating the deity. There's a distinction in the manner a neophyte and an advanced devotee appreciate the Lord's presence in the temple. A neophyte considers the Arch of Igraha to be different from the original personality of Godhead. He considers it a representation of the Supreme Lord in the form of a deity. But an advanced devotee accepts a deity in the temple as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Very nice to understand this point, very important. The advanced devotee, they don't just simply see a deity, they actually see the Lord there. So they're very conscious that this is the Lord. 
We talk of the deity as the Archa Vigraha. It's one of the Lord's incarnations. Just as, as the Lord appears, uh, Faita, he appears in different forms, different incarnations, the deity is also an incarnation of the Lord. He's come in the form of the deity. So, don't just simply think only as a, oh, a statue different from Krishna. This is Krishna, actually Krishna, he's come. So, and he's come in the most wonderful form. We want to appreciate this. This is the vision of a devotee whose devotional service is in the highest stage of bhava, or love of God, whereas a neophyte's worship in the temple is a matter of routine duty. They're both devotees, but they're on different levels. And someone is actually advanced. The, the Prabhupada said, the, the stage of bhava, love of God, they're seeing Krishna there. They don't just see the statue, they see Krishna. So, other person, they're doing sadhana bhakti, the rules and regulations. So, different attitude. Then Vaishnava Association. Text number 16. Vishwa, it is said by Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, even if one is a Vaishnava, if he is not of good character, his company should be avoided, although he may be offered the respect of a Vaishnava. Anyone who accepts Vishnu as the Supreme Personality of Godhead is accepted as a Vaishnava, but a Vaishnava is expected to develop all the good qualities of the demigods. So we were making this point earlier when Madhiji asked her question. You know, people come to the temple and they're devotees, but they haven't developed all the good qualities. Company, the company should be avoided, but we respect them within the mind. They're devotees. In the Nectar of Instruction, Rupa Goswami also says that we mentally honour one who chants the holy name. And somebody else has undergone spiritual initiation and is engaged in worshipping the deity, they're more advanced. And somebody else is even more advanced, we heard. Somebody else is even more advanced, they, they, they never criticise anybody. And they're always thinking how to worship the Lord, how to glorify the Lord, full of all the good qualities. So like the mango, there's a green mango and the ripe mango. And so somebody is like a green mango, the, the, the character is not very good, maybe they're a new devotee, they just came to Krishna consciousness. So their character is a little doubtful. They're like the green mango, but if they stay, I mean, they've come to Krishna, and if they stay, the mango will become ripe. The qualities will develop, the good qualities. How much we develop the good qualities will depend on how we apply ourselves to the process. It's up to us how much we want to get purified. If we follow the instructions of the teachers, the acharyas, we will get purified. And if we don't follow, we cannot expect to get the same result. Patience is going to take time. Right? The exact meaning of the word sattvena is given by Sridhar Swami as being synonymous with dharyena or patience. We saw this also in Nectar of Instruction, Rupa Goswami also spoke about patience, utsahan nischayad dharyat. 
So, enthusiasm, patience, and determination. Patience is, is also an important quality. Prabhupada gave the example about the, the young girl, when she gets married, she immediately wants a child. It's going to take a little time. Not that immediately she married, she's married, she gets a child. It will take some time. So same way coming to Krishna consciousness is going to take some patience. But we should be cautious about being too patient. So if we become too patient, then it's also not good. And we have, we're so patient, we have no enthusiasm, and we just, we're just very, oh, be patient, oh, yeah, yeah, gradually, but one day, oh, one day I'll take initiation, yeah, one day I'll chant 16 rounds, right now I'm chanting one round, you know, right now I'm chanting one round, uh, maybe in the future, maybe I'll chant more, yeah, be patient, give me more time. <laughs> yeah. How much time do they need? Time is of the essence, don't waste time. But still patience, some patience has to be there. One must perform devotional service with great patience. One should not give up the execution of devotional service because one or two attempts have not been successful. One must continue. Srila Rupa Goswami also confirms that one should be very enthusiastic and execute devotional service with patience and confidence. Patience is necessary for developing the confidence that Krishna will certainly accept me because I am engaging in devotional service. One has only to execute service according to the rules and regulations to ensure success. So, uh, for some things we have to be patient. For some things like developing uh, pure love of God, uh, you know, I, I want to know when am I going to get bhava and prema, uh, well, we will we'll have to have a bit patience for that. It will come gradually, but you have to be patient. Don't expect to get trembling of the body and hair standing on end and tears coming from your eyes like rain very quickly. These are, you know, levels of ecstasy are going to take time, but still devotee should be patient. I think this statement very nice from Prabhupada, Krishna will certainly accept me because I am engaging in devotional service. So patience, one of the, one important quality which we have to have trying to chant the holy name purely. We have to be patient, we have to practice. Hmm? It's going to take some time. Doesn't mean we just take it easy and don't bother, oh, we'll have, oh, just be patient. We have to endeavor, patience, but at the same time endeavor. Enthusiasm should be there. qualities of the Madhyama Adhikari, also given in this chapter, you see, the Madhyama Adhikari being dis described. Pure devotees should execute devotional service by giving greatest respect to the spiritual master and the acharyas, should be compassionate to the poor, make friendship with persons who are his equals, but all his activities should be executed under regulation and with control of the senses. I discussed this point earlier with you, it already came up. So note again, Madhyam Adhikari, this quality, respect and worship of the Lord and respect for the Acharyas. Make friends, we, should, we have to have friends, we should make friends with equals, all, it's not good to be always with juniors. If you're always with juniors and they're always respecting you, they won't correct you. They just all, only respect you. It's not good. It's very important to get association with people who are your equals 
peers, peer association, we say. Let's see. Because they will criticize you. They'll find fault. They'll tell you this is not right. They'll like, so it's good to get association with people who are, are equal and who are over us. But compassion should be there also for the poor. All right, more qualities, oh, the same qualities. Humility, humility. Prabhupada quoted the Bible, it says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So humility. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, Trinada pisuni chena tarora pisishnana amanena manadena. Right? Offering respects to others and not being anxious for respect to herself. And similarly in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna describes items of knowledge. And the very first items he mentions is uh, humility and pridelessness. Chapter, uh, chapter 13, Bhagavad Gita. So symptoms of a devotee are meekness and humility. In the, if you're reading the uh, Brihad Bhagavad Amrita, describes Gop Kumar going to Vaikuntha and then he met Narada Muni and Uddhava. He went from Vaikuntha to Dwarka and in Dwarka Narada Muni was telling him about Goloka and he said the quality to go to Goloka, the main quality is humility. You have to be very humble to get into Goloka. You have to be so advanced that you're genuinely humble. Otherwise, you'll never get into Goloka. So the symptoms of a devotee are meekness and humility. Although spiritually very advanced, he will always remain meek and humble. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu taught one should be humbler than the grass on the street, more tolerant than the tree. One should not be proud or falsely puffed up. In this way, one will surely advance in spiritual life. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu taught, lower than the straw in the street. The point is that the spirit soul, the dimension of the spirit soul, is one ten thousandth of the tip of the hair. So, to actually be humble, we should have an ego in proportion to our spiritual dimension. So that spiritual dimension is lower than the straw in the street or grass on the street. The grass is very small. The soul is one ten thousandth the tip of the hair. Our ego should be in proportion to the size of our soul. We shouldn't be thinking, I'm six feet, I'm five foot eight or whatever. So that is genuine humility, having the ego in proportion to our spiritual dimension. And tolerant, like the tree. Trees give shelter. The people come and cut them, they take from them, they take the fruits, they take the flowers, they take whatever they want. The tree does not protest. The tree continues to give shelter. So we can learn from the trees. Nine, text 19 and 20, the results of practicing like this. When one is fully qualified with all these transcendental attributes and his consciousness is thus completely purified, he is immediately attracted simply by hearing my name or hearing my transcendental quality. This is the proof we're becoming pure. The more we're developing a taste for hearing and for chanting, this is the sign we're advancing. As the chariot of air carries an aroma from its source and immediately catches the sense of smell, 
Similarly, one who is constantly engaged in devotional service in Krishna consciousness can catch the Supreme Soul who is equally present everywhere. Krishna is everywhere. We have, we have to catch him. So this example given by Lord Kapila is very appropriate. Just like the air catches the aroma, it passes over the kitchen, it carries the aroma from the kitchen. The same air passes over the garbage, it picks up the aroma from the garbage. So the same way a Krishna conscious devotee can catch the Supreme Soul. Krishna is omnipresent, he's everywhere. We should be able to perceive Krishna everywhere, in every situation. Another example, as a breeze carrying a pleasant fragrance from a garden of flowers at once captures the organ of smell, so one's consciousness, saturated with devotion, can at once capture the transcendental existence of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who in his Paramatma feature is present everywhere, even in the heart of every living being. Krishna is everywhere, in everything. We have to perceive him. We have to develop that vision to see him, to perceive him everywhere. It's possible. It just takes our own consciousness, our effort, our endeavor to actually want to see Krishna certainly is there. Then we goes on to, Lord Kapila goes on to describe about offenses in bhakti and how we may commit offenses. So disregard, I am present in the heart of every living being as the super soul. If one disregards my presence in all beings, his worship of the deity is simply an imitation. It's like offering oblations into the ashes. So you offer, a, put the oblations again into the ashes, no benefit. In the same way, you may worship the deity, but if you're not properly respectful to all the people, all living beings, then it's just, our worship is just simply imitation. We're not going to get the benefit. So we have to understand, you have to be careful. If you're, when you're cleaning the altar, you have some, maybe some creatures coming in. There's that story about the, the mouse or a little rat came in and he used to eat the ghee. And one day he had the ghee wick. And the ghee wick was burning. Somehow he got, he got burned and he died, gave up the body because he had this hot, hot ghee burning ghee lamp. But when he died, next life he became a great devotee because he'd eaten, he died from eating the prasadam offered in the temple. He ate the giwek, but next life he became a great devotee. So that last one, that offense was disregard. You don't have proper respect for other living entities. Here's one, next one, offense in bhakti, hatred. The mind of a separatist who worships me but hates other beings does not attain peace. And you think, oh, this person, no, oh, this person, he never gives any money, he never donates. We hate people, very bad. And then criticism, you criticize it, find fault. I am not pleased with such a person who criticizes other beings, even if he worships with proper rituals and paraphernalia. Don't think just because we're worshiping Krishna that we're, we have the right to criticize people and to be nasty to them. It's all in the class, this is all offensive. Somebody comes to the temple, they're coming to see the deity. We cannot judge their attitude. We shouldn't criticize them, we shouldn't find fault with them. We should be very conscious how we worship the deity. 
six kinds of offences to a Vaishnava. What is the proper behaviour and what is improper? Vaishnava Aparat, one of the Aparats, one of the Anartas in the heart, come from offences. So we should know what are the offences in dealing with devotees. Just as there are offences in chanting the holy name, there are offences in deity worship, there's offences to the Vaishnavas. So here we're given to blaspheme a Vaishnava. Criticism, that's the first offence in chanting the holy name, to blaspheme a devotee. To not offer respectful obeisances upon seeing a Vaishnava. It's an offence if we don't respect the Vaishnava. You may not bow down, but at least within our mind, or at least we fold our hands and we greet them respectfully. And to not feel delight upon seeing a Vaishnava is also an offence. We should be happy to see the devotees. This is important. The right mood. Oh, a devotee is coming. Very nice. How are you, Prabhu? We must greet people, make them feel happy. Do not get angry with a Vaishnava. Don't think bad of a Vaishnava. And do not kill a Vaishnava. You can see different degrees of offences. Killing a Vaishnava, that's of course much more, more serious. And to get angry with a Vaishnava, that's then violence. And don't feel delight, that's a subtle thing, but it's also, it becomes also, it's also offensive. So we have to be conscious, we have to know what are these offences. Is it clear? Any questions? No. Hare Krishna Maharaj, I have a question that... Uh, 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 that if someone uh, hurts a devotee and then somehow that is rectified and everything is, but still that is lingering in the heart. So when we see a Vaishnava, um, maybe I would try to not come in front of that Vaishnava. So I'm still, uh, uh, theoretically I understand I'm committing a, uh, an offense, but how would I rectify that in my heart? that that person has hurt me or I see it as uh, as Krishna's hand in it that something happened like that so I learned the lesson how how, how would I understand well, not commit an offense but Prabhupada, Prabhupada instructs us he said this somebody may offend you you should think I must have offended them in my past life that I've done something to them in the past and that's why they are offending me now. And so now the karma is nullified and, and thank you, accept it. And one time Prabhupada was giving a lecture and a man stood up in the middle of Prabhupada's lecture and be began to blaspheme him and criticize him and then he walked out. And Prabhupada just said, I must have offended him in my previous life. Thank you so much for the, the wonderful answer that gives peace to my heart. Now, and there's another question related to humility that uh, sometimes because we are all individuals, there are difference of opinions and you know, someone may accuse falsely. So we, we tolerate uh, and externally and even try to internally seek forgiveness. But that may sometimes lead to carrying anger in the heart. So why that anger is still there if I am trying my best to be humble, accept the situation even though it's not my fault. Um, so how would I um, resolve that within my heart so that I don't be carry anger in my heart, but that even though it's not my fault that you would accuse or so that, that will still be counted as humility. How? Because I'm still carrying some kind of uh, unpleasantness in my heart, so I'm still not humble in that sense, even though I apologized. Yes, so we have to understand the, the, the anger. Where is the anger coming from? Where does anger come from? It's coming from our own identification with the self, attachment to the body, because of desire, lust. 
By contemplating the objects of the senses, a person develops attachment from them. From such attachment, lust develops, and from lust comes anger. So the anger comes due to our own frustrated lust. When we don't get what we want, we become angry. And so we have to understand the nature of this anger and how it's degrading us. And we have to really work against it. How to overcome it? Simply take shelter of the holy name of Krishna and call out to Krishna, Oh Krishna, save me! I'm becoming, I'm becoming angry, I'm becoming controlled by my lower nature. We have the lower nature, we have the higher nature. You have to come to the higher nature. You have to crush that lower nature and you have to take full shelter of Krishna, call out his holy name, sing a bhajan, go and see the deities, and that way you get rid of the anger. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Thank you so much. Yeah, any other questions? Okay, we'll go ahead. Thank Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Uh, Maharaj, while we were talking about how uh, pure devotees don't have a desire for uh, liberation and all of that, and we are not anywhere in that state. Uh, so right now in the state that we are, uh, is it still okay to uh, pray to the Lord saying, I want to go back to Godhead? Or it's, it's, I mean, it will be considered mixed, I guess, because there is some desire. Well, but, uh, I, I know, we, I know we, we had the experience, there was one lady in in her temple. I was in New York at the time and the, the lady, she was uh, with a, a di she had a critical disease and she was going to leave her body soon. And she was saying, she had somehow she got to meet Prabhupada and she told Prabhupada, Prabhupada, I just want to take birth in my next life and come and distribute your books again. She had been a Sankirtan devotee, you know, and she distributed books nicely and she was dying and she told Prabhupada, I just want to come back my next life and distribute books. And Prabhupada said, no, no, it's okay, you just go back to Godhead. So Prabhupada certainly encouraged her in that case, go back to Godhead, get liberation, get out of this material world. You don't need to come back. But <laughs> it, it, it seems to change. Sometimes Prabhupada would say, don't come back. And sometimes probably say devotee will, doesn't care about his own liberation. So definitely you want to, we want to understand the nature of the material world. We want to think about coming to the liberated platform. That's very good. We want, we, we should want to be with Krishna. Jiva Goswami actually says when the devotee is liberated, they don't immediately go back to Godhead but they go to a planet where Krishna is appearing and they take part in Krishna's pastimes because he said we will need more training before we can go back to Godhead. So we get like more training by taking another birth where Krishna is performing his lila and taking part in this lila. So okay, you want liberation? Yes, good. Think, we think about liberation. That is liberation, going to be with Krishna. Wherever Krishna is, that is liberation. All right? Thank you, Maharaj. Yeah. Certainly, we want to. We don't want to be attached to this world. We should be thinking this world to to see it for see it for what it is a temporary place of misery. It's not our real home. Our real home is with Krishna in the spiritual world. We want to go there to be with Krishna. So, respecting all living beings, different kinds of blasphemy of a devotee. Blaspheme the devotees. What does that mean? We may criticize him for low birth or caste. That's criticizing their body. Low birth. Low caste, it's material. We may criticize someone because of sinful activities before they surrender to Krishna. Oh, that person, he was a drunkard. Oh, he was a terrible person before he became a devotee. He was so sinful. We, we should not criticize, we should appreciate. Krishna is so kind, so wonderful. 
that even the sin people from sinful lives have come to Krishna. Or we may criticize someone for some unpremeditated accidental fall down. So some, somebody may do something, you know, just by accident, they did something, maybe they somehow, they had a, somebody, somebody gave them a glass, they didn't realize it was alcohol, they, they drank a whole thing of alcohol, they didn't know, they thought it was some drink, and some, they thought it was some soft drink and it was alcohol. So it was unpremeditated, so we shouldn't criticize them for that. To blaspheme a Vaishnava for the last traces of his sins or faults that are almost rectified. So we have some faults, we have some bad habits, you know, we're not pure, we're still on the path. But we don't criticize someone, just like, you know, somebody, maybe you went and played football and you come back, you're all muddy and dirty, so you have to take a shower. So you can't criticize someone if they're in the shower. They're already in the shower cleaning themselves. You can't criticize them for being dirty. And so similarly, a devotee, he's taken up the process of bhakti yoga. He's working on purifying himself. We should not criticize them. In time, they will become pure. Just like I said about the mango, the green mango, in time it will become the ripe mango. So this is proper respect for devotees. Bhaktivinoda Thakur says, oh, okay. If we criticize him, bear bad feelings towards him, or hear him criticized, we are involved in the sadhu ninda. So we don't want to hear, or we don't, and we don't want to keep bad feelings either. We want to be careful of that. Blaspheming a devotee incurs the anger of Krishna. So this is from Harinam Chintamani, but it's all in relation to respecting other living beings. Because Lord Kapila spoke about respecting. So how to, how to, what's the solution to this? We should realize the presence of the Lord in everyone. Seeing everyone, seeing every living entity as a part and parcel of the Lord. Prabhupada explains, a devotee should try to understand everything in relationship with Krishna and try to serve everything in that spirit. To serve everything means to engage everything in the service of Krishna. If a person is innocent and does not know his relationship with Krishna, an advanced devotee should try to engage him in the service of Krishna. One who is advanced in Krishna consciousness can engage not only the living being, but everything in the service of Krishna. Prabhupada could do that. One, one of Prabhupada's servants was a devotee called Upendra. So when Upendra got initiated, he gave Prabhupada, he gave Prabhupada some blanket which he had. And Prabhupada looked at it and said, what is this? <laughs> and he said, it's blanket Prabhupada, I thought, I thought you might like it. Prabhupada said, this is useless. <laughs> he didn't think it was very useful. Prabhupada was in San Francisco at the time, and it was summer, not very useful. No, a panda was a bit crushed. Prabhupada said, this is useless. But the, the next evening he came and he saw Prabhupada put the blanket on the floor and he let people sit on it. And so then he felt happy that Prabhupada was making use of it. And so he used it in the service of Krishna. Another devotee gave Prabhupada a watch. Another devotee gave Prabhupada a ring. Prabhupada would wear them. Prabhupada didn't need them, but he would... You know, he wanted to engage everything in the service of Krishna. That is the point. So, devotee utilizes everything for Krishna's service. The example is there, the flower. The devotee will give the flower to Krishna.
A, live, a devotee should not ignore any living entity. The devotee must know that in every living entity, however insignificant he may be, even in an ant, God is present. And therefore, every living entity should be kindly treated and should not be subjected to any violence. I was with Srila Prabhupada one time in London and we went to a Hindu temple and they had big pictures of Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva. So Prabhupada gave the lecture and he spoke about how God's not only in the heart of Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva, he's also in the ant, the tiny insect like an ant. And he said a devotee of Krishna not only offers respect to Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva, a devotee of Krishna will offer respects even to the tiny insect like an ant. And that pastime is there, Magrari the hunter, Magrari wouldn't step on the insects after he started chanting the holy name, he'd become purified, he, he would sweep the insects out of the path, he wouldn't touch them. Prabhupada explains, in modern civilized society, slaughterhouses are regularly maintained and supported by a certain type of religious principle. But without knowledge of the presence of God in every living entity, any so-called advancement of human civilization, either spiritual or material, is to be understood as being in the mode of ignorance. So-called advancement. Because they have no knowledge of God in every living entity's heart. So it's the mode of ignorance. Slaughterhouses and in the name of religion. It's all bogus. Similarly, we may offer many valuable items to the deity, but if we have no real sense of devotion, and no real sense of the Lord's presence everywhere, then we are lacking in devotional service. In such a state of ignorance, we cannot offer anything acceptable to the Lord. Right? If we have no real sense of devotion, no sense of the Lord's presence everywhere, then our devotional service is not really complete. We have to understand how the Lord is in everyone and have proper respect for all living beings. Without that, Krishna will not accept our offering. Prasadam distribution. It is not that one should create a temple in his private apartment or private room, offer something to the Lord, and then eat. One should exhibit his compassion for ignorant living entities by distributing prasadam. Distribution of prasad to the ignorant masses of people is essential for persons who make offerings to the personality of Godhead. Right? When we make offerings to our deity, it shouldn't just be for us. We have to distribute and distribute to the, ig the ignorant masses of people. That's very much appreciated by Lord Krishna when we will distribute prasadam to everyone. And who needs prasadam? Everyone. Not just the poor. Don't just go to the poor. Give to everyone. Prasadam distribute. If you're not distributing the prasadam, then your, your deity worship is not really very good, very low standard. It's only a little better than animals. Mana, respect, is offered to a superior and charity is offered to an inferior. So offering respect to Srila Prabhupada and 
we give charity to somebody who is inferior. Difference. Mana e dana. Mana. Respect. You don't give charity to a superior. You give charity to an inferior. So when we offer charity to a superior, it's out of respect. It's not actually charity, it's being respectful. It's different. Then grad gradations of different living beings, Lord Kapila is describing different species of life, how they're not all equal, different levels of creatures, one level above the other. Described earlier also about those living entities who have legs, or food for those who don't, uh, they eat those living entities who don't have legs. Those living entities who have legs, they may be eaten by those who have got arms. Like that, one species higher than another. One living entity is food for another. So it's mentioned here, living entities are superior to inanimate objects. Right. We have consciousness, living entities have consciousness. Inanimate objects, no consciousness. O oh, Blessed Mother, and among them, living entities who display life symptoms are better. Animals with developed consciousness are better than them, and better still are those who have developed sense perception. So it goes on like that from verse 28, this is verse 20, it goes up to 33, different levels of gradations of living entity. We must treat the lower living entities compassionately, but this does not mean that we have to treat them in the same way we treat other human beings. The feeling of equality must be there, but the treatment should be discriminating. Just how discrimination should be maintained is given in the following six verses concerning the different grades of living conditions. Just like a tiger, tiger is also a soul, but it doesn't mean you go and embrace the tiger like you would embrace the devotee. Yeah, we're all equal, but we have to know how to discriminate. Just like we don't let dogs come in the temple, because they cannot discriminate that this is a temple. We keep them outside. We can give them prasada, we can chant the holy name, but we don't let them just do whatever we do. We have to understand how to deal with different creatures. So discrimination has to be there. Proper understanding. Lord Kapila's conclusion. A perfect devotee offers respect to every living entity because he is under the firm conviction the personality of Godhead has entered the body of every living entity as the super soul or controller. My dear mother, O daughter of Manu, a devotee who applies the science of devotional service and mystic yoga in this way can achieve the abode of the Supreme Person simply by that devotional service. This Purusha, whom the individual soul must approach, is the eternal form of the Supreme Personality of Godhead and is known as Brahman and Paramatma. He is the transcendental chief personality and his activities are all spiritual. Then this last section of the chapter, the Devahuti wanted to know about time. So it's described here in this last section up to the end of the chapter. Time is actually the personality of Godhead, who is the enjoyer of all sacrifices, the master of all mystics. In Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna has also said, Kalosmin, I am time I am, destroyer of the world, and I come to claim all people. So time is Krishna, the enjoyer of sacrifices, the master of everything. The time factor which causes the transformation of the various material manifestation is another feature of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Anyone who does not know that time is the same Supreme Personality is afraid of the time factor. Anyone who does not know that time is the same Supreme Personality, in other words, time is Krishna. 
if they don't know that, then they'll be afraid of time. Devotees are not afraid of time. Devotees take shelter. They know Krishna is time. Hmm. And we see Krishna in the form of time. So the different points which have come out of this chapter are listed here, one after another. First section, up to text 13, we should follow the principles of devotional service without desire, including becoming liberated other than to please the Lord. That is called pure devotional service. Second point, 14 to 19, verses 14 to 19, one should execute his duties, prescribe duties and one's devotional activities regularly. Not just sporadically, regularly. Thus, spontaneous attraction to Krishna's names, qualities and pastimes develop from practicing pure devotional service. We practice regularly, we will develop the attraction for Krishna's names and pastime. Third point, from verses 20 to 35, respect all living entities as Krishna, as the super soul is within everyone's heart. So we spent a bit of time on that, talking about proper respect. The fourth point, 36 up to 43, we must approach the super soul, the Lord in the heart. He is the supreme controller, the time factor and the goal of yoga. And we have to approach Krishna there. In the, in the fifth section from verse 40, 44, knowledge of time is Lord Vishnu's energy impels one to understand the all-devouring effect of time and detach one from material activities. Time, all-devouring effect of time, helps us to become detached from the material world. We see the body age, we see the body deteriorate, we become less and less interested in the material world. We, we're no longer thinking to enjoy. We understand more that effect of time, how it's deteriorating everything. So, we should be intelligent to prepare for the next life, to prepare, prepare for the future. So, final quote here. First of all, there was vibration. Then from vibration, there was sky creation, beginning of creation, and then from sky there was sound, then from sound there was air, then from air there was electricity or fire, then from electricity there was water, and from water there is land. This is sharply described. Then how the mind is created, intelligence is created, how the controller is created, so it is not that we are simply chanting and dancing. That is the ultimate goal of life. But we know how this creation has taken place, how it is being maintained, how it will be annihilated, what will happen after annihilation. Everything we know by the Sankhya philosophy. So. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Okay, any questions? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Um, please accept my obligations. So we have uh, seen the. we should not criticize us of, or offend our Vaishnava or a practicing devotee. But uh, the same applies to non, who are not practicing also. Am I right? Yes, of course. 
we're careful in dealing with all living entities. We were taught, the chapter teaches us respect for all living entities. That Krishna is in the heart of every living entity. So we have to deal with them respectfully. Bhaktivinoda Thakur emphatically says that uh, you should be careful of the devotees because they are on the purificatory process. But one should be more careful with the non-devotees because they are not come to the platform. So it will be more painful for them and for us also if we deal wrongly. That is more grave, I, mean, I want to say. Am I right? Yes. Right. If you're quoting back to Vinod Thakur, <laughs> you couldn't be wrong. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Yeah. Uh, Maharaj, uh, uh, we, we see that uh, in Abrahamic religions, uh, like there is uh, uh, mandatory that, uh, you know, uh, that they do the animal sacrifice, uh, marking, you know, how uh, Abraham, instead of uh, giving his uh, son as a uh, as the uh, sacrifice, he sacrificed the goat or some animal. So like this, uh, in most Abrahamic religions, there is this sacrifice principle of sacrifice. They sacrifice a goat, sheep, cow, or a camel, and that's how even in the Mecca, the holy Mecca, uh, we see that every day there are millions of uh, animals sacrificed, and they say that we are chanting a specific hymn. A specific mantra in the ear of that animal and that animal is getting liberated to the spiritual world by that mantra so you know this is not uh, the kind of violence that we are doing don't think that this is the violence that we are doing this we are doing as per god's instruction and we are liberating all these jivas to the spiritual world so how do we counter this uh, argument by these abrahamic uh, followers well you know, I don't think you want to try to be uh, debating with people about their own beliefs. You know, they're very attached to these things, meat-eating, difficult. Prabhupada did say that with Christianity, he didn't want us to preach to people unless they accept that they shouldn't eat meat. So. Prabhupada spoke to one cardinal, and the cardinal, you know, he was a big, this, in Paris this was, a French cardinal. He met Prabhupada, and they had a long discussion about belief. And Prabhupada always just talked to the man about meat eating, that meat eating is wrong. And if, he said, if people can't accept that the meat eating is wrong, then don't preach any more to them because it's such a basic point. So it's not that you want to be attacking their, or talking of something negative about their belief, but the point is that we, we, we have respect for all forms of life. So these people, their business is killing, cutting the throat of all these animals as you say, millions every day, then, you know, th because they're so cold-hearted, so ca lacking so much in compassion, they can, and every day they're killing more, so it means they become more and more covered every day, more and more ensnared in, in, in sinful activities. It's going to be very difficult for them to understand. But there are, people from the other traditions who are vegetarian. So you can try to find, well, like one man, I met one man in Calcutta, uh, he was a, a Muslim and he was a teacher. He taught in one of the colleges there in Calcutta and he'd written a book, The Bhagavad Gita and the Quran. And he compared the two, and he showed the Bhagavad Gita and the Quran but had the same message. And his family were vegetarian. He and his family, wife and children, all vegetarian. And they were Muslim, but they were vegetarian. And so, you know, you're talking to Abrahamic people, you want to 
convince them. Not an easy field of preaching. Difficult. Generally, we try to encourage them to, in the chanting of the name of God. Thank you, Maharaj. We would encourage them, the holy name of the Lord can also liberate them without killing them. You can, it's not that you have to kill them to liberate them, but you can chant the holy name of the Lord, you can give them the same benefit. You can liberate them and spare their life. Let them die a natural death. Because we understand that when they're, when they're killed, they, well, of course they're saying they get liberated. But what do they mean? What do they know about liberation? Where do they go? Do they know anything about the kingdom of God? These animals that are being liberated? The animals are being liberated. Are the people who eat the meat, are they also being liberated? We see people who eat meat and so many diseases coming, so many problems are coming because of the killing animals, because they're killing the cows, because they're killing their mother. The whole world is suffering. So it's a very difficult situation. We, we want to have more prasadam distribution, give people more the opportunity to appreciate that you can eat very nicely and can be happy and healthy on a vegetarian diet. We had one scientific conference in Juhu and uh, a number of scientists came from the West, a prominent scientist, Nobel Prize winner came from the West to attend a conference in Juhu. So one devotee was taking him to the airport after the conference and he was talking to the professor in the car as he went to the airport and he asked him, how did you like the conference? And the professor, he said, you know what I learned from this conference? He said, one thing I've learned from it is that I can be satisfied on a vegetarian diet. Because he came to the conference, everything was vegetarian, all the prasadam was prepared there in the Juhu temple. And so they had very nice prasadam arranged. And he said, I, he said, I'm very satisfied with the prasadam. He said, I never understood that I could be so satisfied with a vegetarian diet. So often people, they don't know, they're in ignorance. They're thinking they have to eat meat to be healthy. Of course, it's not necessary. They're thinking being a vegetarian means you just eat salad only. They don't know. They have no experience. So we need to try to arrange more to give people the opportunity to taste Krishna Prasadam and to understand that it's practical, that it can solve a lot of economic problems. You can feed many more people off the land when you use the land to grow vegetables rather than to feed animals. We're wasting so much land just in the name of raising animals for slaughter. And then you have horrible things like slaughter houses also. So much cruelty and they, they're thinking it in the name of civilization. It's in the name of degradation, all of these things are there. So somehow we have to we have to be trying to give Krishna consciousness in different forms. We give the the prasadam, give the holy name, which shares knowledge, economic principles, philosophical principles. How much they can understand? Well, we we have to try. Not everybody is going to accept, but if, if even a small number, if even a small number of people are convinced, it can make some good for the world. No, it's certainly a difficult thing. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Prabhupada went to America. He, people were not vegetarian. 
But Prabhupada, by his preaching and by his cooking, he attracted people to be vegetarian. Nice cooking, nice food stuff. Nobody complained, nobody said, I want meat. They were happy. They would say, give me more chapati. <laughs> so we have to introduce nice prasadam to people. Okay, thank you Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Any other question? Thank you very much, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Yes, Prabhu. Uh, there is one question in the last uh, 35, 40 years, uh, you know, because there is a huge amount of insecticides, uh, huge amount of pesticides, uh, which is being used in the agriculture and farming, which is resulting in a huge cost of uh, life and a huge amount of uh, violence vis-a-vis -vis the small insects from earthworms to other, uh, uh, you know, small insects which are also friendly to the farmer. Uh, that is one. And on the second side, the huge amount of, uh, you know, use of uh, machines uh, in dairy farming and uh, for, uh, you know, uh, and uh, in terms of taking out milk from the cow is concerned, using, uh, you know, injections to increase the yield of uh, the milk. All these are, uh, you know, violence, which we are, as Vaishnavas, are also directly or indirectly getting associated with. Wanted your thoughts on this, Maharaj. Yeah, it's very unfortunate, very nasty business, that dairy farming became an industry there's no thought, personal care of the cow, the personal dealings with the cow. And certainly the cows suffer terribly with this mechanization, automation system to drain everything out from the cows. Certainly we don't encourage it, we don't approve it. And similarly also with the agriculture, it's the same mode, exploitation, to get as much as you can out of the land. And simply we're, we're raping the land, forcing the land to give more. But at, at our own cost, the quality of the grains, the nutrition which is there in the food, everything is reduced. People are not healthier today. We're in a much poorer condition than we were years ago because of all of this automation industry and chemicals everywhere. Everything you touch is full of chemicals. It's very difficult to live here. That's why we have so many diseases, cancer, now we have the COVID also, and so many things. It's all because of our abuse of the planet. We're suffering, the results. We're all suffering because of the abuse to the planet in the form of so many chemicals and all these different methods to try to take more from the land. It's all in the name of greed. We want more, we have to get more, take more. They have built so many houses everywhere and take more and more from the land. So what can we do about it? We want to show our own lifestyle we like to have our own farming communities and, pr and show people how you can live naturally off the land without all these chemicals and without this automation and mechanization. You live naturally and you can have a satisfying, happy life. So our farming communities are very important. We, we like to encourage devotees to go there, live there, and make your life there, bring up your family there, living off the land. In the future we don't know what the results are going to be. We don't know how, how much, what's going to happen to the planet. But we can protect ourselves if we have our own farms, we have our own land, we have our own cows. We don't have to depend on others. Prabhupada wanted, we produce our own grains. Prabhupada even wanted, we produce our own paper. He said, in the future you may not be able to get paper to print books. He said, you should know how to have paper. Make your own paper and like that. 
So Prabhupada was telling us, he was warning us, what's the future? He said, you should know this world is not going to last. You cannot go on the way it's going on. And you can, we can see now it's fallen apart. When this COVID began, we thought it's just going to be a short time. It's still going on. We don't know when it will end. We're thinking vaccine, is the vaccine going to end it? We, we don't, it's unlikely. So we have to prepare, we have to protect ourselves and going to the land, and having our own farming communities is very much encouraged and appreciated. That's my feelings on the matter. Yeah, any other question? Okay, so then we'll meet on Monday again. We'll continue. Next week there's only, I think, four classes. We'll finish everything. Not long chapters, not heavy chapters. You can look over them briefly. And we'll meet on Monday morning. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada ki. Gore back to Vrinda ki. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Oh, Haribo.